So the entire mission of the SEC is to make sure that people are protected. But after watching this interview, I have to ask the question, who exactly is the SEC and Gary Gensler actually protecting? And there was an interview just recently this morning. It was from CNBC. And the host here is just asking Gary a couple of very simple questions. One of those questions are, is Ethereum a commodity or a security? And then he went over a couple of questions that went over the recent consensus lawsuit. And if you're not familiar, court documents that was filed by the Ethereum software firm Consensus on April 29th, uh, that SEC and Gensler appear to have believed for at least a year that Ether was an unregistered security, trading out of compliance with current federal regulations. So it is Gary's job to essentially tell Congress where he believes these different assets are falling into. He sat before Congress, sat before a committee, and he pretty much has said, I don't know what it is, but apparently from these court documents, it's saying that the SEC is already leaning a certain way and is already pretty much saying that, hey, Ethereum is a security. And this is actually from Patrick McHenry, and he is the uh, chairman of the fin financial committee. And he was asking the exact same question. He's like, look, just months ago, we had a, a hearing and you essentially lied to us. So what I'd like to hear is from this interview, these answers to these two questions. Just take a listen. You agree? Oh, you're the one that's out there asking the questions. All I would say is, to me, the fundamental question is, is how do we ensure that the American investor is protected? And right now they're not getting the required or needed disclosures. And the intermediaries in the center of this rather centralized market generally are conflicted and doing things we would never allow the New York Stock Exchange to do. The okay. New York Stock Exchange is not allowed to right. trade against the investors. Okay, but let me ask you about this. You've seen the consensus lawsuit, and I know you have a Wells notice uh, uh, with them as well. This is uh, uh, Patrick Henry saying the following, and I want you to respond to it. Just months after a federal judge sanctioned SEC enforcement lawyers for lying in court, new evidence shows that Chair Gary Gensler himself misled Congress. The testimony of the Financial Services Committee last uh, April, Chair Gensler refused to answer questions about the SEC's classification of ether, and new court filings show this was an intentional attempt to misrepresent the commission's position. The, we speak to Congress directly in hearings like that, and also directly to members, and we share with them uh, uh, accurately what we're doing. So that the viewers can also understand we don't speak about uh, whether we have an investigation or whether we don't have an investigation and we don't speak about whether somebody is, in our opinion, not following the law unless we actually right. bring a case. So we stay uh, quiet on many right. questions that you might ask at this right. live interview or even but ultimately in should investors a congressional It's so fantastic. I have to ask myself, listening to the answer there, which he didn't actually answer the question. The question was, why did you misrepresent yourself to Congress? And he talked about lawsuits and things that are going on. But the actual question was, why did you misrepresent yourself to Congress and say that you didn't understand or didn't believe or didn't really think about the fact that Ethereum is actually a security when in tour documents, it looks like they already have. So there's that piece. And the next piece I have to ask myself is, why do we even have hearings? Because if we're going to have Gary Gensler just sit up there and just kind of him and haw and go, well, this is that and that and that. Oh, you ran out of time? Okay, here's the next question. It's like nothing ever gets done. So I, again, I think this is a, going to be a choke point, an issue. Let me know what you think about that in the comments section. And it actually gets worse. So now we're going to go from the SEC to the CFTC for commodities. And it looks like crypto firms are going to see more enforcement actions within the next two years. This is from the CFTC chair, Rostin Benham. And here's what he actually said. He said, we're going to probably see in the next six to 18 months or six to 24 months, another cycle of enforcement actions because of the cycle of asset appreciation and interest by retail investors without a regulatory framework. Let me say that one more time. Without a regulatory framework, without transparency, without tools that we typically use as regulators, you're going to continue to see this fraud and manipulation, and you're going to see these organizations, these SEC, the CFTC, to really try to crack down, to live within the guidelines of which Congress is actually given. So again, it asks the, I have to ask the question, if they just need guidance, how far does it take for Congress to actually act? And that was actually answered uh, right down here. And I was actually pleasantly surprised. So I try to give you 
the bad news and then balance it out with some good news. Benham agreed with the moderator that having U.S. lawmakers bring crypto firms into the regulatory framework was the proper course of action. Sounds level-headed. Members of the House of Representatives are awaiting a floor vote on legislation that could clarify the rules or the roles of the SEC and CFTC over digital assets, which moved out of committee <laughs> a year ago in July 2020, roughly. Right now we're in May 2024. According to a Cornerstone Research report released in January, number of crypto-related enforcement cases brought by the SEC in 2023 was the highest since 2013. And actually, it was roughly a third of all enforcement actions that the CFTC had taken against crypto occurred last year. So again, it will be really great to get some guidance from Congress. Hopefully, they can get off their seats and actually do something. But it's not all bad, because as things negatively happen in America and we drag our feet, other countries will, will pick up the slack. Colombian bank launches a crypto exchange and peso stablecoin. Here's what we got. Colombia's largest bank, Banco Colombia, has entered the crypto business by launching a crypto exchange called Winya. The crypto platform aims to be on board 60,000 users in its first year and compete with Binance and Bitso. Along with the crypto exchange, the Colombian bank also launched a stablecoin called COPW, which is pegged to the Colombian peso. And this is what was interesting to me. Not only is, again, other countries picking up the slack, of where America is lagging behind, this centralized exchange will allow the trading of Bitcoin, Ethereum, USD coin, and Polygon's Matic. And when I saw that, it was pretty interesting because we've been talking about Polygon on this channel for years. And it seemed like it was kind of falling out of favor, but just recently, so you had that Colombian bank, you had actually, there was a story about uh, MoonPay integrating with uh, PayPal, so people can actually purchase crypto through PayPal. There was another story from that was Stripe was integrating uh, USDC, Solana, and Ethereum, and also unburied underneath the information, Polygon and Matic. So that was three different big, large entities. And if I took a look at it, I had to steal some information from Ben's website. Yet again, you know, the cryptoverse, there's these things called time and risk bands. And I remember seeing just how low Polygon or Matic had actually gone. Now, if we can see, I'm going to put show all of this. These are all the different time and risk bands. We are the redder it is, the more overheated it is, and of course, the cooler means that it's a uh, you know rock bottom prices. If I just show you right here, if we go to 0 0.001 for the risk bands, you can see that uh, these are some pretty low prices. This was uh, it was on 2019 when Polygon was a penny, and then also when it was about four cents, seven cents somewhere on there. So we didn't get that. How about 0.1 to 0 0.2? Yeah, somewhere around 8 cents, somewhere around 7, 12 cents, somewhere around there, somewhere around 15 cents. But then look at this, 0 0.2 to 0 0.3. What do you notice? Today, it is in those risk bands. So if you're a believer in dynamic dollar cost averaging, this might be a time to take a look at Polygon or Matic and pick some up. So that is that piece. Then to finish up, ETFs. So again, balance to all the stories. Hong Kong spot Bitcoin ETF sees as the first outflows solely from China AMC, and this is actually not good news. Hong Kong spot Bitcoin exchange or ETF recorded their first cumulative daily Bitcoin outflows on Monday solely from China Asset Management ETF after debuting on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange on April 30th. And everybody was talking about how great this would be, but it was really lackluster. Not too many things really came out of it. The other two ETFs recorded zero inflows, not good. And that came after the three funds logged an inflow of 3,910 Bitcoin on the first trading day. So it looks like things are turning negative for the ETF in Hong Kong, which I'm really not too surprised or really too excited or negatively affected because we all knew that uh, this Hong Kong ETF was not going to be big. The real money is in the States. And you can see that the uh, ETF Bitcoin flows just for yesterday. I mean, you're looking at 3,400 Bitcoin just yesterday inflows. And if we see, take a look at cumulative, we're actually not at the all-time high cumulative for the Bitcoin uh, flows of the ETFs, but we're doing pretty good. And I still say we're in the right place at the right time. But lastly, I would like to remind you that we are still early. This is a post from Bitcoin Magazine. This is from the uh, there's a Ohio State commencement speaker. He's talking about Bitcoin. It's about 50 seconds or so. And what was surprising to me is just how people took the reaction. So just take a listen to this. Great investors are open-minded and understand things before other people. So I know this might feel polarizing,
but I encourage you to keep an open mind right now. I see Bitcoin as a very misunderstood asset class. <sighs> it's decentralized and finite, which means no government can print more at will. In the early days, the exchanges for Bitcoin were prone to hacks and fraud, but the issue has been resolved with the recent launch of the Bitcoin ETFs backed by two of the world's largest uh, asset managers, BlackRock and Fidelity. So anyone could hold these ETFs in your retirement account. So yeah, I just remember, just because you know we love Bitcoin and we love crypto and digital assets doesn't mean that everybody else is out there. There are gonna be people that just don't get it and that's okay because you get Bitcoin at the price you deserve. And that's it for today. So look, like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing everything we talk about is time sensitive. That's it for this piece. Thanks so much for stopping by. I do appreciate you and I'll see you on the next one.